and this is Changing the Narrative. I'm your host, David Reeves, and we are changing the narrative every day and in every way. We've been spoon-fed a narrative of atheism. We have been spoon-fed a narrative of naturalism for maybe the last three generations, maybe more. But we are changing the narrative back to truth. That's right. We're talking about the truth of God's word. We're talking about the truth of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the truth of the gospel message itself. And today I have a friend. Helmut, could you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background here? Okay. I am Helmut Welk. That's how I pronounce it. Uh, I was born in Germany, but I grew up in Chicago. We came, uh, immigrated to Chicago when I was an infant. And uh, so I didn't know a lot of German as a kid, but then uh, all my education was in English, went to the University of Illinois, did well. Then I went to work for a Fortune 100 company for about 38 years. And now I have uh, retired here in Tennessee, so I'm glad to be able to join you today. It is wonderful to have you in studio in the Wonder Center. Uh, we, we basically just opened up the museum about three or four months ago. And it just so happened that it coincided with a move for you as well. Uh, so we're really excited about working with you on some of these uh, future unwrapped conferences with the Genesis Science Society and with getting some of these top creation speakers, which, by the way, you have interfaced with a lot of these people, as have I, over the years, because mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, I had the television program uh, in Texas on TBN and the TV program here. Uh, and you ran a very large creation conference, uh, a monthly conference. In, was it in the Tri-Cities area? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, about 15 years ago, I helped form the Quad City Creation Science Association, and that was a local creation group. And we would bring in uh, speakers from around the country, some of the, the well-known ones. Yeah. I would occasionally start to speak. and. Uh, kind of blossomed into my own uh, creation science speaking career. As, as far as events, we would do, uh, we would try to do about 10 per year okay. and then do one bigger conference. Uh, but then I was also involved with a group called Creation Summit. And our target there was to get on the college campuses and get the word out of truth, what real science confirms, uh, the Bible, the resurrection of Christ, but also that you know Darwinian evolution uh, in modern science term has become a 19th century myth, but we don't hear about that much very often, do we? <laughs> we don't. We always hear you have to follow the science, follow the science. And yet the vast majority of the scientific community for the past you know, 50 years or so has been following pseudoscience. Yes. And they're following principles that actually can't be tested, repeated, observed, or demonstrated. And I find that quite appalling. But what about the... Speaking on college campuses, have you done some of that internationally as well as here in the States? Uh, yes. Um, I started out by bringing in other speakers like Dr. Russ Humphreys, Dr. Yeah. Steve Austin, uh, several others. And then I started doing a little bit uh, speaking on atheism and the origin of life. Uh, did that several times in this country. And more recently, just a couple of months ago, uh, I was invited to speak at the Technical University of Dresden, wow. which is in eastern Germany, yeah. and we had a good group there, and uh, a lot of people with young people with good questions, and uh, we're still following up on some of those. There's uh, some people with uh, meeting with the local uh, okay. Christians to learn more about Christ yeah. and the truth of the gospel. You know, when I've traveled to Europe in the past, what I've noticed is that there is a, a slightly older generation that uh, leans towards atheism. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that the young people on the campus might be a little bit more receptive than maybe the, the last generation to a different view on things? Yeah, David, I think that's very true. Okay. The, uh, the young people are beginning to realize that a lot of their parents and that generation, which is obviously younger than me, um, they don't have a lot of answers to the meaning of life, uh, where we came from. They, uh, they, they hear messages that just kind of put down the Bible and Christianity and religion in general in many cases. But they're wondering, is there more to it and what else can I learn? And so, yeah, there's a lot more openness than there may have been, and I'm seeing that. That's good. You're an engineer. Mm-hmm. You have training as an engineer, and 
Yet there are many engineers uh, working today that when they see something in nature that follows engineering principles, that follows design principles, very much, they look at it from a completely naturalistic way as if somehow it just happened. Let's talk about atheism and let's talk about how it has become sort of this this uh, click or maybe due to peer pressure there is kind of like this this thing where it's cool to be an intellectual atheist can you discuss that for a few minutes yeah i've seen that it's um uh, it's very interesting uh, they they know in most cases especially in academia uh, there are some informed uh, atheists who are uh, pretty much dominating our academics today but they kind of know that they don't have the answers to the origin of life, right. that uh, they, we're learning more and more how complex it is. It's getting harder and harder for them. And so I, I met one professor, uh, I think this was at Bradley University in Illinois, and uh, I challenged him on the origin of life. He said, oh yeah, I know, but they're working on it. <laughs> so he had a statement of faith mm -hmm that we're gonna figure this out, that it can happen by chance. But what, he was not a science type, and so he didn't know that it's actually getting harder. Yeah. Uh, things like chirality, the, you know, the left-handedness mm -hmm. of the uh, amino acids that make pro, uh, proteins in life. Uh, if you do it by chance, like the Miller-Urey experiments, you get 50-50. Right. Uh, just what you'd expect in a randomness. Yeah. But your body knows to make just the left-handed ones, and they don't have a clue how that happens. Okay, talk about chirality for a moment, because it's a concept that we have to break down for some of our audience, and some of our audience is familiar, but basically it's the handedness of certain amino acids and the way that they are spiraled, or, or they are created, and what we find is that in life you've got all left-handed shapes, mm -hmm. and what we find anytime we try to do experiments is approximately a 50-50 mix, which means not life, it means death. It That's has right. to be 100% left. Yeah, the, the left-handedness, you got to remember that uh, amino acids is a 3D molecule, so it's like your left hand and right hand, mm -hmm. where you cannot put one on the other, the same thing with a left-handed and right-handed car door. You've got to have the right car door on the right side. The internal parts, yeah. some of them are identical, Right, But when you construct it properly, the left-handed only goes on the left-handed. Now with amino acids, your body knows to make and use just left-handed amino acids and they form the chains, very long chains, of just the right sequence to make a protein that your body can use. Okay. And the Miller-Urey experiments and everything since then, if you try to do it randomly, you'd get what you'd expect, a 50-50 distribution. Lefties and righties. It's random, yes. But the amino acids used in life are only left-handed. And the presence of one right-handed amino acid mm -hmm. in this chain or in this area where you're supposedly creating life, yeah. well, it stops the formation of proteins. So you're right, it becomes death. And how your body does that, they don't know. Some right. people think God is left-handed maybe because of <laughs> only using <laughs> left-handed amino go. acids. Uh, okay, so if we can explain it, and now, here's where it gets really interesting, because as Christians, we can't explain everything that we've seen. We can't explain everything that the Bible mm -hmm. has recorded historically. We couldn't explain through physical properties or through naturalism the virgin birth, right? We couldn't yeah. explain. Not possible. Right. And so we admit that as Christians, there are things that we can not explain through natural scientific principles. But then... If you take this logically, what we find is that within the scientific community, there are quite a few principles, quite a few things, including the origin of life, that cannot be explained naturally or through scientific principles. And as you mentioned, Helmut, their, their only explanation is, well, someone's working on it. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second, because usually the person saying, well, we're working on it, they assume that the biologists are working on it. And the biologist, if you question them, they say, oh, yeah, well, the, the geologists are working on the origin of all of it. Uh, and then, oh, well, the, the microbiologists are going to handle yeah. this eventually. They just keep kicking the can down the road, and nobody knows the answer. That's right. And as I said, it is getting harder. The more we learn about this, the chirality, the complex arrangement, the very specific nature of the sequence, yeah. 
and how then that long chain of amino acids gets folded into a protein precisely, it's getting more difficult. And so it's for them, you know, and I'm talking about an atheistic uh, person, whether it's a professor or not, yeah. it's, it's a belief system mm. that this could have happened by chance. And so the statement, while well, they're working on it, is a statement of faith that someday we'll get it, but there's no evidence we will. Hmm. So it's purely faith-based. That's why atheism is just another religion. Okay. It has its own adherents by faith. It has its own people who get angry if you question their faith. Right. And very much the same principles. If you want to believe mm -hmm. in atheism, that God doesn't exist. Oh, I can't see him, so he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine, yeah. but don't teach it as science. <laughs> it's a faith-based idea. I like that. You mentioned a moment ago the, the idea that, and I'll just rephrase, correct me if I'm wrong, new scientific principles and discoveries are showing advanced complexity through biological systems, which makes it more and more difficult to explain the evolution of mankind. It makes it more and more difficult to explain naturalistic origins. And when we think about yeah. that for a second, what we're saying is that new science is pointing towards a designer, whereas antiquated scientific principles like Darwinian evolution, it's yeah. time we throw them in the garbage. It's really true. It's really true. If you know, uh, if you start learning much about genetics, uh, a little bit about the design, the biochemistry of life, yeah. it, uh, it's looking more and more like a designer. And, and that's how I approach this subject as an engineer. Uh, you use a very key word, and that's systems or mm -hmm. biosystems. Now, I was a systems and industrial engineer, and I would work on systems of how to build a machine, a car, a tractor, or somehow. And you need a very complex system of many different parts working together, all the material coming at the right point at the right time with the good quality to make an, uh, an automobile, for example. Sure. Yeah. And that is a system, learning to be in system thinking. And biosystems is the same thing. As we look at the complexity of the cell, you're talking about a very complex system with many parts that all have to be there. They all have to function correctly. Otherwise, it dies. Right. And so that's how uh, we need to approach this subject, I think, and that's what I talk about a lot, is systems thinking. Okay. I need multiple parts. I need many things working together smoothly, yeah. doing all their functions, and then I produce the end product, either whether it's a living cell or a, a nice car that you can drive off the assembly line. I like that, okay. So if we could break it down a little bit further, there are systems that are separate from each other, but they are functioning systems, right? And then those functioning systems overlap each other to create basically a, a vast biological system like a human being mm -hmm. that is irreducibly complex. It really is. I mean, in a factory, we can talk about particular systems, but you're right. It's not just one system with many moving parts and are working together. But now we have a system of systems, yeah. which, which is uh, the point you're getting at, and it's a very good point. So the level of complexity is getting higher and it's harder. You know, in Darwin's day, they thought the, a cell was just a little blob of protoplasm. <laughs> you know, maybe had a skin and inside was something like jello. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. that these things could kind of rearrange themselves, make an eyeball, make a face, do what, heart muscle, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, now we know that's not, not at all true. Yeah. Not at all. It's that simplistic thinking. Uh, it reminds me of a quote. Uh, I think it was Sir Francis Bacon who said, <laughs> A little bit of science estranges a man from God. Okay, mm -hmm. I know a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm the philosophy professor, and I can <laughs> I know a little bit. I've heard about these things from biologists. Uh -huh. But a lot of science, yes. Francis Bacon goes on. He says, a lot of science brings men back. Right. Back to God. The deeper you go, the more evident it is yes. that we have a God behind this. Yeah, there has to be a creator God. If you want to stay logical, if you want to stick with the facts and start understanding these things, even if you're not an expert, but you can start understanding the level of complexity here. Yeah. When you start putting that all together, you go, oh my goodness, there has to be a creator. And there have been many people, many scientists who've come to that conclusion. Yeah. So it's not, you know, static. 
Right. There are people who finally realizing, yes, there's a creator God. Can you tell me more about him? Yes. Yeah. And, and it's time to change the narrative. And that's what we're doing here today. That's what you have devoted a portion of your life to doing. That's what I've devoted a portion of my life to doing. It's like we're trying to not only share the truth of God's word, but also to change this pseudoscientific narrative back to reality. I want to know a little bit about, let's go back a ways. Have you always considered yourself a Christian? Have you ever had doubts? How did your interest in this topic come about? Well, uh, I would say, like many people growing up in America in the last you know, half century or so, that, uh, yeah, I considered myself a Christian. Uh, and then, you know, when we asked each other what religion you are, we, you know, oh, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Lutheran, I'm Catholic, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, Baptist, something and so on. Yeah. But uh, I went off to the University of Illinois. I uh, was a good student. My parents, you know, wanted me to be a Christian. They gave me the knowledge that I needed, training. Uh, but then you're in college, you know, that first year you're on your own. And then I had a professor who said, ah, if you want to study science, you can't believe in God. Hmm. And if you believe in God, you can't do science. Well, those were hard words for a young uh, engineering student because mm -hmm. you have to know science to apply it to the real world. Yeah. And, you, and I also wanted to believe in God, but those were good words, good questions. Mm -hmm. And so for several months, I uh, was looking at that. And I had some friends on the uh, my dormitory at that time who were Christians. There were different Christian groups, and they gave me some books. Apologetics was important for me at mm -hmm. that time. In those days, Josh McDowell was uh, yeah. relatively new. He had a great speaker on the resurrection of Christ. So I decided if Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead, yeah. not a very scientific topic, right? Or, but if he did then I would follow the Bible. Mm -hmm. But if I don't think he did, then I would stop playing the game. Mm -hmm. I would stop pretending to be a Christian. I would stop going to church. Why bother if he didn't really rise from the dead? Well, Josh McDowell, and there are other speakers uh, that you can find, uh, other books that, of people who've looked for the same question. Is that really true? Was there a resurrection from the dead? And many of them became Christians because it is true. Wow. The, the evidence, the uh, testimony of history, archaeology, it shows that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead. So I concluded that I wanted to make sure I was a Christian, invited Christ into my heart to forgive me all my yeah. sins. And then I studied the Bible more than any engineering book in the next four years, but mm -hmm. God blessed me and gave me good grades. Uh, but I always had questions like, mm -hmm. what about the Lucy fossil? What about mm -hmm. uh, the origin of life? What about you know, dinosaurs and carbon-14? And so I just started studying those as a hobby for the next 40 years, and uh, I have seen that we have a lot of good answers, and now I speak on them. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. You know, if we were to talk about, take any of those topics you just men mentioned, dinosaurs in the Bible, or, or Lucy, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of questions when people come through the museum on human evolution. Because they've been told that, you know, fossils like Artie and Lucy and Java Man and this one and that, these are all missing link fossils. These are types of ape-like creatures who are beginning to turn into human-like creatures. And you can still find many of these things in anthropology books, in biology textbooks. In high school books. Exactly. And they're presented pretty much as fact that this is the evidence that we evolved from ape-like ancestors. And then you start to delve in, but you see, you have to be willing to research because those books don't delve into details. They simply state an incorrect statement as a fact. Yes. And very few people look it up, but you start to delve in. But they'll show you nice pictures. Oh yeah, it looks very convincing in the photos, yes. in the illustrations, in the diagrams. And that's what evolution lives on. Mm -hmm. You know, statements that this is true and then they show you artistic renditions. Yeah. And, and when I talk about ape men and the fossils in that area, I, I tell students, you know, very politely ask, can I see the original fossil? Yeah. Can I see what we actually have, what the facts are, mm -hmm. and not the artistic renditions, the ideas and the stories behind them? Mm -hmm. And people are mostly surprised when they see the actual bones of what they have yeah. compared to what is drawn. They go, really? Yeah. That's 
that drawing is 95% imagination <laughs> based on what you want to believe. Uh -huh. The bones don't really look like that. It could be, it could be anything. It could be right. maybe just a pure ape or it might be pure human, a real human. That's right. Like Neanderthals have been shown to be 100% human. Yes. Not an in, be in between kind. It will, in, in some cases, you'll have not just full ape or full human, but sometimes, like in the case of Java Man, right? We have a coffee shop on site, a little cafe here in the museum called Java Man Cafe. Nice. Well, every coffee cup has a little sticker, and we tell the story of Java Man because everybody started, oh, Java Man, Java Man, right? Well, Java Man was found on the Isle of Java, yes. and he was scattered out across a, a wide area, and different remnants were found. But what was found? Well, you know, uh, a portion of a skull cap was found. Well, um, a femur bone was found. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, a tooth was found. Well, that's it. That's Three it. small <laughs> fossils and this is the proof they've created this entire ape-like human ancestor out of three little bones. And what's not often told is that the, the leg bone, the femur, was actually several feet away from the rest of the bones. Right. Not, and I'm talking about 10, 20 feet. <laughs> so is it even very possible that this is a conglomerate creature that one might have belonged to one type of a creature and, then, and the tooth and the skull cap might have belonged to another? Very possible. And then... But we have to question these things. We have to question it. And I think in the case of Java Man, that's exactly what it turned out to be. Yeah. They, deter they found some more bones, and they realized that, you know, this part over here is truly an ape-like right. creature. I think more like an orangutan, an extinct type of orangutan. And then the other part was fully human. Yeah. So tonight, uh, on the Wonders Theater stage, you are going to be sharing a message. Um, genetics in the Bible. And, um, you know, three or four hundred people are going to be sitting up there learning, going out and sharing with their friends. Right. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, we broadcast the unwrapped, the monthly creation events live on Genesis Science Network, where there are hundreds of thousands of people who have downloaded our apps, who are watching online, uh, who are watching on terrestrial television. And those people who are watching those, the, the people who are listening right now to this, if they go out and they share with their friends, maybe yeah. with that skeptic coworker, maybe with that family member who always wants to argue over the Thanksgiving meal, right? Right. Just little bits and hints. We can all make a difference. We can all change this narrative back to biblical truth. Tell me, give me a hint, just a one minute hint of what we're gonna be learning about when it, with regards to genetics and the Bible tonight. Okay, we're gonna uh, look at the field of genetics, and I, by the way, know personally yeah. two world-class geneticists, one in Europe and one in America, and then casually a few others in this country. And basically, genetics is information science. Okay. It's information. Where does the information come from, and what happens to that information? And what, I'm an engineer, so what I do is put the the model of evolution on a graph. Okay. And the model of creation on a graph. And mm -hmm. they're really quite different. And I'm gonna try to teach people that you can do this too. Take a napkin, piece of paper, put these two graphs on the bottom, the x-axis, you're gonna have time. Mm -hmm. On the y-axis is how much information and good information do you have in the genome. Okay. And over time, the evolution model says what? Everything's that it going to be more complex, has to go better. Up. Yeah, right. Yeah. You can put whatever time you want. But at the lower left, you're going to be going up with more information okay. over time to make more and more complex creatures. Mm -hmm. You need that information. Okay. And then we'll look at some of the evidence and ideas and if which one is really plausible. <laughs> I love it. I, I cannot wait. Um, now, we both have mutual friends uh, who are world-class scientists. I know a few that um, are coming to speak over the next few uh, monthly conferences. One is Dr. Brian Thomas. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Thomas has pioneered some of the collagen and biomaterial information in dinosaur bones. He is researching and finding these 
It's basically like soft tissue. It's a very degradable substance within dinosaur bones that should be gone. Yeah. Had these dinosaurs have lived, died, you know, 66 plus million years ago. Um, Joe Hubbard, who is a, not only a zoologist, but a zoo director from the UK who has researched animal biology. Uh, we're talking about people like Dr. Joe DeWeese, who in microbiology is studying um, different different uh, types of structures that actually have potential anti-cancer uses mm. uh, within medicine. Cutting edge science is pointing us right back to our creator and ultimately to the gospel message because who is our creator? Yeah. Well, if we take it all the way back and then we look at the New Testament, we see that the word became flesh yeah. and dwelt among us and that this creator loved us so much that he became our redeemer that yes. he is here for us so that we can have eternal life with him mm -hmm. for all of eternity and if we just realize how special we are the question i ask myself all the time is would that would that hurt society or would it benefit it if we yeah. only knew that human life has value if we only realized that there is purpose for life what would that do to the suicide rate what would it oh, do yeah. to the school shootings to the atrocities that we see in 30 seconds wrap it up for us helmet well on that note when i was younger uh we had all these songs out uh you know what the world needs now is love sweet love <laughs> or all you need is love you know i was a fan of some of those groups <laughs> and that type of music in the 60s and 70s but we don't hear that much anymore. Yeah. And in those days, people were looking for love, but they were looking in the wrong places. If you want to find love, it is in the Bible. For God so loved the world, he gave his mm -hmm. only son. And so today, they're even not even looking for love. And so in our culture, we're getting wrapped up in a lot of things that talk about hate and yeah. my group is better than your group. But we need to turn back to love, just like you said, and find the origin of love, which is God himself. Thank you, Helmut Velt, for being here today. And thank you for joining us on Changing the Narrative. I'm your host, David Reeves. I want you to remember until next time to keep looking up. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Find us on all social platforms to stay informed. Watch Genesis Science Network 24-7 for free on Roku, Fire TV, and on our website. Visit the world's largest origins-based store, creationsuperstore.com.